Yeah. All right, everyone. Hello. Thank you very much um, for coming tonight. Um, thank you as well to our panel members for coming tonight and giving up your time. Um, this is event is about students having a chance to hear directly and transparently from university management and members of UCU committee. Um, so I'd like to remind everyone that the event is being recorded and will be available afterwards. This is also a student focused event. Well, so, so while there may be other observers here, we will only be accepting questions from students. So please let's honour that. Thank you very much. Um, and last of all, but most importantly, please remember to treat everyone with respect and dignity throughout the event. If we feel that anyone is being disruptive or disrespectful, then we will be kindly asking you to leave. So let's just keep that in mind, please. And that is the point of tonight as well. Um, before we hear directly from our panel members, I'm going to give a brief bit of background about the actual strike dispute at the moment for those who might not know all of the intimate details. Um, so the current February and March strikes follow on the, from the October mandate achieved by the University and College Union when a national ballot asked members to strike over USS pensions and pay and conditions. There was a record turnout and that was achieved and across the country UCU members voted to strike. The USS pension scheme is the university's superannuation scheme and the largest private pension scheme in the UK. Recently, the USS announced a cut to how much lecturers will receive in the pensions, and now UCU is demanding employers to revoke the massive cuts which they impose on members of the USS pension scheme and put pressure on USS to restore benefits to 2021, 2021 levels as soon as possible. UCU also want the university's UK body to put strong pressure on USS to ensure that the next and all that the next and all sub subsequent valuations of the financial health of the scheme to be evidence-based and are moderately prudent. For pay and conditions, UCU is demanding an increase to all spine points on the national pay scale of at least inflation, RPI, plus 2% or 12%, whichever is the highest. They are also asking for nationally agreed action using an intersectional approach to close the gender, ethnic and disability pay gaps, an agreed framework to eliminate precarious employment practices by universities, nationally agreed action to address excessive workloads and unpaid work, to include addressing the impact that excessive workloads are having on workforce stress and ill health, and for the standard weekly full time contract of employment to be 35 hours with no loss of pay. The University of Leicester is a member of the UCA, which is the Universities and Colleges Employers Association, and this is the body that represents the university when no negotiating with unions, including UCU. Pay is not decided directly by the individual institution, but rather by UCA, UCA who has the power to offer pay increases. The current mandate lasts until April and includes full strike and action short of strike, which is continuous. There are 18 days of action across February and March, three of which have already taken place. There is currently no mandate for a marking assessment boycott, but UCU will reballot in the coming weeks to see if there will be one during the summer assessment period. We will now move to UCU to have a five minute in intro and then University will have a five minute intro and they'll have the chance to respond to each other. Then we will go to some pre-submitted questions and then we will open the floor to questions. When you're asking questions, you'll have about two minutes and also two minutes to respond. Um, and just remember that we are Treat everyone with some dignity and respect. So, Joseph, over to you. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Renan. Thanks for the to the Students' Union for hosting this important event. And I want to here formally thank students who have voted in referendum after re after referendum, uh, host organised by the Students' Union to back the UCU Union uh, in our struggle over pay and pensions. It means a lot to us. And I've been thinking about why students consistently at Leicester have voted in large numbers decisively to support us. And I think it's for the very simple reason that if you're a student, if you have direct contact with lecturers and teaching staff at the university, you recognise, you understand that no one does this for fame or fortune. We do this because we care about producing world class research and because we believe that education and teaching can be empowering, can raise people up, can lead to more creative, independent minded human beings and is an enormous boon and benefit to society. That's why we do it. That's why something like a fifth of university workers across the country work more than two days extra per week uh, above their contracted hours. It's why we feel the pressure of intensifying student numbers and workloads and all the rest of it. We have members coming to us week in, week out, saying, I'm thinking of leaving the profession, saying that they cannot cope, members in tears because of the pressures that they face 
as academics. People talk about a mental health emergency among students, and that's something that's real and palpable, but among staff as well at a national level, the latest data suggests 50 plus percent of academics uh, suffer symptoms of depression. It reflects what's happened to the university system uh, in recent years. Uh, a quarter of academic staff are on casualized contracts. They don't have the confidence and certainty that they'll be working here next year or the year after. And on top of all that, we are seeing a massive devaluation of the work that we do. It's about pensions, but it's also about pay. On pensions, we have seen our pension provision uh, in retirement for people of my generation fall by over 30%. And over pay, we have seen year after the year, the erosion of the reward for teaching. Uh, across the board, we've seen something like a, a, a decline of 20% in the years from 2011 to 2021 in our real take home pay. In the past year alone, we've seen another fall of 10%. This is why we're taking the unprecedented step of calling 18 days of strike action. It's not because we like taking strike action. It's not because we want to do it. It's because nothing else has worked. No one listens to us. That's why we're doing this. Because the problem is in the modern university system, staff have become the shock absorbers for all the pressure, all the pressure that's put on that system. And this impacts on students. Our working conditions are your learning conditions. If you have a casualized, stressed, underpaid, devalued workforce, it will play out in terms of the conditions under which students learn. And that's why we're fighting not just for this generation of students, we're fighting for every subsequent generation. We are people who are serious about defending education in this country. That's our life, life's work. Now, I want to focus finally on the issue of pay. Uh, there are lots of groups of workers. It's not just university workers, it's uh, school teachers, it's health workers. Large numbers of people have been hit by the cost of living crisis. The argument is always the same from the executive board. It's not whether I would love to know whether the executive board think it's morally acceptable for our pay to fall by 25, 30 uh, percent over this period. I'd love to know what their answer is to that. But the argument is always they can't afford to pay. They can do nothing about it. It's not true. Universities in Britain are sitting on cash uh, surpluses of 3.5 four billion pounds. That's seven thousand pounds for every staff member working in higher education. On top of that, uh, UCU has put together figures showing that universities are preparing to splash four point six billion pounds on capital expenditure, far more than we have asked for to resolve this dispute. The point is staff matter and students matter. We're far more important than vanity projects, real estate and all the rest of it. We're what make education great, staff and students. That's where the resources should be put. And we're asking, I'll finish on this, for the executive board to reconsider its position, to stop criticising UCU for the action it's taking, to stand shoulder to shoulder with staff and students. I'm saying to Nishan, be a real citizen of change. Stand up for your staff. And let's have some real change. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. We'll now pass to the university. And once you guys have your five minutes, you'll each have two minutes to respond to each other. Thank you very much, Rhiannon. OK, good afternoon, everyone. Good to see you all. And thank you for giving the opportunity to say uh, my position in terms of the current dispute. As Rhiannon said, there are a number of issues that have been raised by UCU about pay, pensions, precarity and gender pay gap. And I'm very pleased uh, the university has been working with the union, UCU, uh, and our other unions as well, Unison and Unite, to make some progress in the areas where we can realistically do. So, for example, I'm pleased with the progress we have made on precarity. There's more work to be done. 
Similarly, in terms of gender pay gap, it's reducing. We need to do more work and we'll continue to do so, more work. So the number of areas we're working very collaboratively and we will continue to do that. But I also want to acknowledge at this moment the disruption some of the action is causing on our students and their learning. We're doing everything we can to minimize that, but clearly there are certainly the staff member is not available. We can't deal with it ourselves, but we have measures which we can talk about in detail about how we are supporting our students during this difficult time. So the two areas where we can't do anything by ourselves is regarding pensions and pay. As Rhiannon quite clearly articulated, these are national bargaining. UCR negotiates on behalf of all the institutions. There are about 140 institutions in this country. They're collectively discussing what the pay should be across the sector and what the pension should be of the sector. So I, on my own, like to be a real citizen of change and do everything by myself. But unfortunately, they are part of the national bargaining. We are not allowed to do it by ourselves. So if I now take the pay as an example, and I think everybody recognizes that the country as a whole is having a significant economic crisis in terms of pay, raising pay everywhere, in terms of nurses and teachers, as Joseph mentioned. So what can happen? So if you think about nurses and teachers, the government is asked to help them with meeting the pay, increasing pay. But unfortunately, they won't do that for universities. We are not part of the government's scheme to give salaries. We have to fund the salaries ourselves. So just to give you an example, UCI have already made an offer to UCU saying that we would like to give you a 5% increase in your pay. Now, 5% increase in pay for this university is 8 million a year. So I have to find 8 million a year. And next year, our utility, our bills will go up by 4 million a year. So in 12 million a year, next year, I have to find 12 million additional income to support the 5% growth increase in pay and the increase in utility cost. So I'm just going to briefly explain to what can I do. I can try and increase the income. How do I increase the income? The university gets income from tuition fees, and that is the main source of income. And the last 10 years, the reason the university staff pay hasn't gone up because the teaching fee income hasn't gone up. It's flat fee of 9,250. So the fee is staying the same for the last 10 years. Year on year, we have been adding inflation. Year on year, we have been giving our staff annual pay increments. It has all been going up and it becomes very difficult to keep up the increase in cost without an increase in income. The second option is clearly we use some of the surplus we have. Now, as uh, Joseph mentioned, there is a big number used by UCU, the size of the uh, sector's reserves. But 60% of that reserve and surplus is held by seven institutions. The 132 institutions have no money to the same degree to afford that. So it's not like we can go and tell Oxford, can you give us some of your surplus fees so we can pay increased salary for my staff in Leicester? It doesn't work like that. So it doesn't really help the fact that there is 4.2 billion reserves in any use to other institutions which doesn't have that reserve. So we can't use the reserve. In this university, we have not been making a huge surplus. Just to give you an example, if we make 8 million additional costs to our pay, very soon we will find the university cannot meet all its expenditure. Our income is larger, uh, lower than our expenditure. That means we enter into a deficit. I, as vice chancellor, will not allow this university to go to a deficit because that is not. That means I can't run the university. Either I have to reduce significantly cost elsewhere, or some of my staff will not be paid. That is not an acceptable position. So we need to manage the university within the resources we have. So that is why I think you will hear very often this reserve that is mentioned uh, by UCU is really doesn't help the institutions like Leicester or many other institutions which are worse than Leicester are really having financial struggle. The third alternative is we cut costs. Nobody likes to cut costs. So at the moment we are looking at where we can make some savings, but nobody wants to lose, lose their jobs because clearly in some universities you can read in the newspapers, there are some universities finding it difficult and they are thinking about major restructuring programs and we don't want to be in that position either. So what we are trying to do is to see how we can live within the means that we have and understand the pressures the staff have and see how we can give a realistic pay increase, which is what has been tabled by UCR, 5% increase. That is still a struggle for many of the institutions that I talk to. So we will try and support them, and that's all we can do within the resources we have, but I'm very happy to respond to specific points uh, uh, that Joseph mentioned later. Would either of you like to have, respond? As you went first, you want to respond to what they said first? Or? No? So, no, I think I covered that in my specific point. I think just want to be absolutely clear. The main point that um, uh, Joseph mentioned that I, he wants me to do more changes in this institution, I like to, 
but the reserve doesn't help uh, University of Leicester, Joseph. It is 60% in seven institutions. So the 132 institutions in this country don't have access to that reserve. Can I, yeah. Yeah, if I may make a few points. Uh, first of all, Nishan talks about a 5% pay increase. 5% is not a pay increase. 5% is a 9% pay cut. And Nishan still has not responded to this basic moral question. Is it right that our pay falls by 30% over, over 12 or 13 yeah. years? Is that a defensible position or is it something Nishan feels that we should come together and fight over? I'm very happy to reach out a hand of friendship to Nishan and say we'll stand full square together and demand that the government restructure higher education so we don't see our pay fall year after year after year. But that's never been proposed to us. All we get are the same excuses and evasions. And I'm sick of it. I'm sick of not people not giving us a clear answer. Do you support the attack that's taking place on our pay and pensions or not? Eight million pounds. Eight million pounds is a lot of money. The surplus for this university was 10 million pounds. Don't tell me the money's not there. Look at the investments in capital expenditure, Miss University. You make choices. You make choices about this stuff. Now, the final point I want to make in response. You say that you can't do anything over pensions and pay. I mean, at one level, that's true. You see a, of a national uh, pay body, Universities UK, we're, we're negotiating with over pensions. Over pensions, lots of vice chancellors have come out and made public statements saying that they don't agree with the valuation made of the scheme and supporting elements of UCU's position. Leicester has chosen not to do that. Over pay, you could say you support a legitimate claim to keep our, our pay at the same level at the very least and not suffer eight or nine percent pay cuts. You've made a choice not to do that. And I think students will judge you based on those choices. Thank you. So to respond to Joseph, there have been discussions of the UK and I think I've made it very clear when I went to the picket line to start to talk to staff who were striking in November, said the best thing you can do is work with the UK to lobby the government for increased funding in higher education. They were always said because the UK, the vice chancellors have said regularly, the higher education system is not for sufficiently funded. Our research is not fully economic costed. We subsidize our research activity. Our, a lot of the infrastructure we have to fund ourselves. The government is reducing all the support that we get for capital projects. So that is the challenge that we have. Absolutely always been very clear with my local UCU colleagues. Please work with us to make that point to that government, not work against each other. In terms of capital projects, I understand there are choices we have to make. This is a fantastic building. We use it for a purpose to teach our students. We have the best learning conditions for our students. Otherwise, they will not come to Leicester. They will go to another institution which provides a better learning experience, a better learning environment. How many of us will say we shouldn't do Freeman's Common? We don't want a very good lecture theater in uh, Bennett. And the other thing to remember is that capital expenditure is once. Eight million increase in pay is every year. It is not a one off. Whereas capital is one off. That is a big difference between a capital expenditure and a recurrent pay cost. We're now going to move to some pre-submitted questions that have come from students. These are directly from students and they have not been edited in any way, so I'm just repeating them as they have come to me. Um, we will first ask the university, as you see you went first to debate, um, from the perspective of students, it looks like you are simply extending the misery of the strikes with the real with no real compensation for impact to students, despite promising to use withheld pay to help us when the strikes impact us. So when do you plan on telling us how you plan to use this money to help us and what will that help be? Thank you. Thank you for the question uh, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Jeff. I'm the registrar in the university. So um, we are doing everything we can in the university to mitigate and minimise the impact of the strike action on our students. In terms of the specific question around compensation, students are all able to make a complaint um, to the university and they are all considered. And we have in previous years considered several thousand 
student complaints in relation to industrial action. I think we've been fairly um, transparent in communicating that to students. So if you feel your studies have been disrupted, um, if you feel the university has um, failed to mitigate the impact on your studies, if you've incurred costs coming to teaching, which has been subsequently cancelled, or if you had cancelled in-person uh, sessions, on all of those grounds, you are able to submit a complaint to the university and we will consider that. Um, and the withheld pay from the strike action taken by the unions is used in the first instance to um, support those student complaints. Uh, and as I say, we have supported um, several thousand complaints in the past and will continue to do so. We also, with those funds, reinvest back into the student experience and those decisions are always taken in partnership with the students' union. So things we have spent money on in the past would include the inclusion fund in the sports service. So that's giving reduced fees uh, and in some cases free access to the gyms for students. We funded laptops in the library. Uh, we funded student support advisors as well in the student welfare service. So there are a range of things that we use the funds for to support the student experience. And that's the decision we take in partnership with the students union. Thank you. To you, see you. Um, I'm aware of some lecturers scabbing on strike days, so the disruption to students' learning is minimised. Do you believe that this undermines the strike action in any way? And in answering, could you also provide a brief definition of scabbing for those who might not know what that is? Hi, everyone. Uh, uh, my name is Natalie. I'm one of the two co chairs of the UCU. I'm a lecturer in law. Yeah, scabbing. So yeah, uh, crossing a picket line, yeah, crossing a picket line, uh, not respecting industrial action, yeah. So uh, I want to make four points. Um, first of all, we ask every member and non-member to strike, um, to withdraw their labour uh, when the when action is called. So we ask every member to do that. Um, striking is a collective action with one common goal. So. We ask everyone to observe it. Yeah, um, there may be a number of reasons people don't go out to strike. Uh, we already heard about um, uh, the cost of living crisis and maybe financial reasons. Um, but uh, we have had members coming to us uh, to us reporting uh, intimidation uh, in, in some occasions. So members have reported to us that more senior members in their schools uh, have said that joining UCU or joining uh, industrial action um, will put their careers at risk, which is very worrying. And I think this has um, disproportionate impact to colleagues perhaps earlier in the career, uh, still on probation, maybe on visas, um, maybe being part of some minority groups. Um, the industrial action disrupts university processes, right? Disrupts university university processes and day to day operations. But industrial action is the last resort uh, for members. Our aim is to achieve better working conditions, not, not just for you in this room, but for future students. So while disruption is short term, the benefits for UK higher education are massive. Yeah, so this is why we're striking. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Yeah. To the university. Um, despite the large surpluses across the sector, the university claims that they can't afford to pay staff the fair wages that the UCU is demanding because of the university's financial situation. If this is true, then surely the most frivolous of expenses should be cut before those as vital as the wages staff rely on to pay their bills and feed their families. So with the university's finances allegedly in such a dire state that they are apparently forced to sacrifice the well-being of their staff, can Nishan tell us exactly how much of his own quarter million salary has been cut to share the burden of these difficulties? So as I mentioned, what we are trying to look at is a gap of 12 million and not quarter of a million. So I think we need to understand my saving of salary is not going to solve the problem entirely. <laughs> Uh, the vice chancellor's salary is set independently by a remuneration committee. It's nothing that I'm not part of that committee. They make the decision on what the appropriate salary should be. And you can see across the sector how different vice chancellors are paid. And uh, uh, it's up to a question for them in terms of whether they should think about my salary. I have not really, they have not released my salary. 
And as I said, the problem is as finding a sustainable solution in the long run that covers a 12 million def- uh, reduction in our income that we can cover the pay increase in the salary cost. TUCU, if the roles were, I can't read, sorry. If the roles were reversed, what would you do to instead, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> My English degree is failing me. If the roles were reversed, what would you do to instead to instead make up the shortfall in money the university is experiencing? Thanks. Well, I make an open offer that I'll swap jobs with Nishan every day, any day. <laughs> um, first thing I'd do if I had Nishan's job is I would voluntarily agree to accept the average wage of staff of a university. I think there's a problem that the vice chancellor is rem- remunerated. Uh, to seven times the median uh, remuneration for staff members in this university. I think it's a scandal that there are low paid staff in this university who are dependent on food banks. I think it's a problem. You know, it, they've given us free cereal and tea and coffee. Um, that's great. We'll take anything we can get. Uh, but I think it was Helga Camara, the archbishop in Brazil, the left wing archbishop, who said, when I feed the poor, they call me a saint. When I ask why the poor have no food, they call me a communist. And I feel a little bit like that when I have to ask, why is it we're dependent on handouts of free cereal? There's a problem here. There is a problem here. Uh, how would I address the shortfall? There is no shortfall. The latest financial report tells, tells us we're in surplus. That's fantastic. So the question is asking the wrong question, really. Uh, the same financial report says uh, both that in the last year, the, the year of the report, we're making 30 million uh, pounds of capital investments. For that money, we could give a 15 percent pay rise to every single staff member in the university from the lowest paid to the most uh, the most well paid in the university. So I think we're asking the wrong question here. We have to rethink the priorities for this university. And I'll say something else as well. What do we make of the fact that between 2017 and 2022, the percentage of people who would recommend working at the University of Leicester fell by 15 percent? There is a problem here. What do we make of the fact that that fewer than 30 percent of staff across the university think that change is well handled at the University of Leicester? This is a problem. We need to rethink how this university is run and what our priorities are. And I would say one final point. We need to integrate the voice of students and staff at every level in this university. We want democratic governance. I'm sick of being told I'm a citizen of change when I don't get any say, I don't get any vote in who's in charge. If you're a real citizen, you get a vote. Otherwise, you're just a subject. So those are the pre-submitted questions that we received beforehand. I will now give both of you a chance to respond to what each party said, and then we'll move to the open floor if either of you want to. I'm OK to move on. <coughs> Two minutes. In terms of uh, Joseph willing to swap the uh, job, it is not my decision. It's the university governing board's decision as to who does this job. But in terms of uh, the pay, Uh, I would like to say, uh, Joseph, you should understand working from business school that paying 30 million once is different from paying 30 million year on year for perpetuity. There's a fundamental difference between paying for one billion, one building in 30 million and paying 30 million increase in salary for the remainder of the university's history. Um, are there any questions in the room? OK, um, the lovely people at the back with microphones, if you could just go uh, blue cardigan. And just a reminder that we're only accepting questions from students and dignity and respect, please, everyone. Thank you. It works, yeah. Um, so some of you may know me. My name is Lou Leslie. I, in first year, run the rent strike, which the vice chancellor inevitably ignored after we protested. You've also ignored the vote of no confidence and labelled it as illegitimate, and you have continually let down staff and students. So I have one question for you. If you feel like you can't do the job, 
why don't you resign? Sorry, Lucy, I beg to disagree. I'm feeling unhappy to do the job and my governing board's decision whether they think I'm able to do my job. Um, in terms of your questions about rent strike, I think again, uh, ask uh, Jeff whether he wants to add more. I think we have worked in partnership with the student union. Clearly, in terms of the uh, various information that you shared, it's the governing board who makes the ultimate decision on who runs the university and they should be making the decision and not anybody in this room or myself. can come back if she wants to. They can come back if they want to. So you keep on coming out with these statistics, but you're not actually responding to the needs of students and you're not responding to the staff. Cost of living crisis is going up. A lot of students are relying on food banks um, and a lot of staff are relying on food banks as well. You need to actually show sympathy and that is where you're going wrong. So this is why I'm asking you, if you don't feel like you're compassionate about your job, why are you in this position? Is it purely just the pay? Is it purely the luxury cards? Is it purely the fact that you feel like you have power over these people? And this is what I don't understand. These are actual people with thoughts and minds and families at home. And there needs to be actual sincerity coming from your job and you fail to do that. We'll have a response and then we'll go to an online question. So just on your point about um, cost of living crisis and the challenges facing staff and students, absolutely, we do understand that as a university. Joseph's already mentioned some of the things we've done for university staff and we would add to that other things we've done, such as reducing cost of car parking on the campus, for example. For students, there is a cost of living award which all students can apply for, either £100 or £200. We've frozen the cost of gym membership during the COVID crisis, there was a huge amount of support in place for students during that pandemic period, including support around food parcels uh, and games packs and uh, mental health support throughout that period. So the university has responded, I would say, in quite a compassionate way, uh, as best as we are able to, to respond to that cost of living crisis facing students uh, in the current climate. And the other thing I would say from a personal perspective, the reason I get out of bed every day to work in this university is because I can see the transformative effect of the education system in this country of which this university is a part and I think students benefit from that and the teachers who deliver it benefit from that. Thank you. Um, our first online question is, where is it then? how will the university support students through a marketing boycott especially after what happened two years ago? Um, this is obviously preemptive of the fact that there might be a marketing assessment boycott but would you it's open to the university, but we can come back as well. Yeah. What would you like us to do? Jeff, go on then. So as Rhiannon Riley says, we're not in a marking assessment boycott situation at the moment. There are a number of aspects of action short of a strike that UCU are taking, which would include not rescheduling classes, not uploading materials in relation to teaching events. Um, so at the moment, uh, our advice is to staff is to, uh, if, if classes are cancelled, we ask them to reschedule if they're able to and willing to do so. We, are, we do ask them to upload material um, to Blackboard uh, and we do ask them to provide materials that uh, could have been available previously uh, or in future semesters, for example, uh, pre-recorded lectures and those sorts of materials. So um, they're the immediate mitigations we've got in place around the current ASOS action. If the uh, situation were to escalate to market assessment boycott, and we certainly hope that will not be the situation, um, there would need to be, uh, I think, a reballot by the UCU and the university has um, faced this situation before. So we do have systems and processes and responses in place that will allow us to deal with that in the summer term if we needed to. And it is absolutely the case that all students will graduate from this university or will progress on to the next year of study. So your academic outcomes would not be affected by any marking and assessment boycott. We will put steps in place to mitigate that and make sure that does not happen. Thank you. Yes, uh, we're, we're not in a marking assessment boycott. Uh, 
I should say that we've been threatened with 25% pay deductions ongoing if we don't reschedule things. We're not being politely asked, we're being threatened uh, here. People should understand that. Um, on the marking and assessment boycott, I passionately hope that we don't get to that point. Uh, it really is the last resort for us. We will have to reballot our membership before we get to that point. It wouldn't come until uh, late April. I hope we can reach a settlement and a deal that supports staff and students before we get to the point of a marking and assessment boycott. Um, that relies on management across the university sector responding to our negotiators demands in a serious way. I'm sorry to say that in one of the negotiating meetings, they said our pay demand, which remember is a pay, is a demand to keep our pay at the same level, was an April Fool's joke. So we're not being taken seriously at the moment. That's why we're, being, we're calling this extraordinary action. That's why the prospect of a market assessment boycott is out there. But as I say, I hope we don't reach that point. Thank you. Good question in the room. Down uh, in the middle. Uh -huh. Yeah. So I just want to preface this by saying I have never spoken to you in my life, not once. And the university, at the end of the day, it's the people that clean the classrooms, it's the people that do the admin work, it's the people that teach me. It's the people that respond to my stupid emails. So I just want to ask, how can you actually ensure the survival of this university when the treatment of staff and academics and admin and technical workers in, at the University of Leicester is enough to drive people away from working in higher education? Because the turnover rate is extremely high at this university. People aren't staying in their jobs. If you want people to work here, or come back to work here, there'll be no people to give references because my lecturers will be out of jobs. I don't want to sound like a broken tape record repeating the same information. So we have a governing board, we have executive board, we have university presidents to kind of work out how do we support all our staff. So absolutely, we support our staff who are doing the cleaning job, the security job, working in the estate, our junior members of staff, senior professors, people working with the hospital in partnership with our local trust. So we have a system in place to make sure we reward the people appropriately and see how we can support them to do the best job. But I entirely understand, as Joseph and I talked about, there are issues facing the higher education sector. So what we need to do is collectively ask the government to make sure the success higher education education sector is properly funded and that requires some thought, support from the government. It's not going to happen overnight. So what we need to do is work with UCU and other unions to lobby them for the change. But in the meantime, we need to manage with the resources we have available. Do you want to come back? Yeah. So you said that you went to the picket to speak with them. That is not making a public statement. That is not making a public statement. That's a casual conversation where you do not show any support at all for the union, basically. So how can you say that oh, I went to the picket line, I spoke to them when you what does that mean? That's just hearsay. You know, you may or may not have done that. And and you say that you uh, work it and it's, you know, it's the governing board and everything. If you can't do anything, what's the point in there being a vice chancellor? That's uh, that's the real question at the end of the day. What's the point in there being a vice chancellor if you won't do anything for your colleagues who are the real people why I am here? If they weren't here, I wouldn't be here. Um, one caveat, I just, it is not here, so I do know that Nishan has actually visited the picket lines just to establish that as a, a fact. Would you like to respond, Nishan? I think the challenge that I'm trying to explain is that I can do certain amount for this university, which I'm trying to do. There are other things outside my control, which is a national issue that I can't change it overnight. I like to think I can, but I can't. So what I can tell you is that as I, uh, Rihanna said, I work with our union colleagues and I will continue to do that. I don't believe in simply making a statement for the sake of it. I'm a member of the UK board, so I can use my influence there to see what kind of changes we can make. And I can tell you I do my part in there. But again, I'm one voice in that board. Um. 
another question in the room? Oh, Anne Marie, you're next to Grace. Jump up, Grace. Uh, so this question for Nishan. Um, how can you personally justify charging 100% of the tuition fees when students are not receiving 100% of the tuition? As Jeff mentioned, this is why we are looking at how we support our students in terms of the learning they get. But I think it is a difficult question because I think what we need to do is when you miss your learning, we try and compensate and make sure you get the learning that you came here for. But I think in terms of learning, it is not simply about attending a single lecture, is it? It's about much more than that. It's the whole environment and over a period of time. We don't cost, I think there is a blog that you can read that the finance director has put up to, for your information. Where does your fee, tuition fee go? It explains where, how we use your tuition fee to manage your learning in, uh, in this institution. How do we support the environment in this institution? So it's not simply a saying, this is the number of lectures I have. This lecture is missed. Can I have a refund of that many lectures that I have missed? So I think it is complex in terms of how the tuition fee is used. And that's why it's very hard to just say how many classes you have missed and can you have a refund? So that's why it doesn't work that as simple as that. I understand it's not simple, which is why you're hired for to be the vice chancellor, as you keep pointing out. Um, but it would be nice to know your justification behind the amount of tuition fees that I've spent at four years spending uh, in study at this university and how I have not seen four years of education. I can so yeah no I can repeat the the um, points I made earlier. So as Nishan says, there are um, there is a, there is a complaint scheme, so you can you can uh, put in a complaint, and we will look at compensation claims for hours of mislearning um, caused by the industrial action, and we and we do that every period of time when there is industrial action. So that's been available to students um, throughout your time um, with us in the university, um, and as I said as well. Um, we will mitigate the situation such that you will still graduate um, from the university with with the degree um, that you that you came to study with us. Um, we'll take an online question before we come back into the room. Um, is it justified to keep expanding our university if we can't afford to maintain staff and buildings that we already have? So as I mentioned earlier, we need to make sure we have enough resource to cover the cost of paying the salary of our staff members, maintaining the infrastructure. So the income that we receive at the moment is through student tuition fees. And some of you will know the other element of the income that we have is international students, which pay, who pay slightly higher. So only way we can generate additional income is if the government doesn't give us any money, we have to generate additional income. The only source of income we have is through tuition fee income. So if you want to maintain this level of service for our staff, the students and increase pay, we have to find additional income and the additional income can one by carefully growing in areas where there is opportunity for growth without compromising on the learning experience and without compromising on the staff workload. And that is a tough balancing act we have to make. Grow where we can to generate the additional income to cover the costs, but at the same time, not at the rate that we can't sustain the activity. And that is the challenge we have unless we find a different source pot of funding that will allow us to expand. If you like, yeah, please. Well, that's just me asking you a question. Uh, yeah, I mean, mentioned you're talking about the accelerated growth strategy, right? That impacts uh, certain departments, including mine. And uh, some of my colleagues are here. Um, yeah, we, 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 we have been offered extra help, uh, administration, and I have new colleagues, which is very, very good. Um, but it's not about the quantity, right? Um, in the law school, uh, we pride ourselves for small group teaching, or we did in the past, a community feeling. Um, it's, not, it's not there anymore. And I, I think I recognize that we have to grow 
in specific areas like business school, engineering, psychology. I don't know if we have students from those schools in the room, but there's much more that needs to be done than hiring new new people. Um, we, we need to make sure that we're offering quality education and we're not just graduating students, but graduating good citizens um, of change. So, yeah. Yeah, just to address that point, my name is Henrietta. I'm head of the College of Social Science, Arts and Humanities. Um, Natalie makes a good point. We've invested in new staff members in areas where there's been growth. Um, it takes some time for that to happen, to recruit new staff and to embed them in, in the school. But we have we've done that and we've invested in different resource within the school. So a lot of the investment, um, a, a lot of the income from the new students does go back into the school and to support the staff and the students in those schools. <coughs> Uh, question in the room. Uh, back white hat. Hi, so my question is that um, a lot of teaching fellows, so early career teaching staff are employed on one year contracts, fixed term contracts. And I'm personally aware of one who will remain anonymous, who was left with no right to remain in the UK, despite having been at the university for a number of years on these rolling contracts. How does the university claim to have a global outlook when it leaves international academics stuck with no right to remain in the UK? Yeah. So Emma, do you want to answer? Or? I can, I'll do it. So really unfortunate situation, but I think what I want to say is the one of the challenges that we have in the higher education system. Sorry to give you a longer explanation, but I'll try and keep it brief. So it's very hard for me to predict how many students we will have in a program at, a, at the start of the academic year, because the students, as you know, choose from a number of other universities. So it's very hard balancing act, and the numbers fluctuate year on year. So Natalie mentioned about small group teaching. If we have 600 staff, well, 600 students, we might need 150 staff. If we have 500, we will only need 100. What do we do? So it is a very difficult uh, balancing act to manage the permanent staff we have. And then what the system does is to see how we can provide additional capacity to support our students. So there are a number of changes to see how we can support the welfare and the long term career opportunities of these staff, whereas, as they are known as a precarious contract, they are on an annual contract. But that is one of the fundamental problems of the system we have in the UK. I'm not subscribing to that, but that is, that is a challenge. The alternative model, which also is problematic, is to fix the number for every institution. That will solve one problem in the sense that the universities can plan their workforce. But the unintended consequences is that there are a lot of poor people from different economic backgrounds will not access our education because we put the limits on the number of people who can enter into our education system. So if we have a system that allows lots of people to come into our education system without knowing how many you will have, then we have a difficulty of planning. The alternative is we can plan, that means some people losing out of higher education. So while I accept that visas um, and the immigration rules are beyond the university's control, the fact is that the casualization and the very nature of fixed term contracts means that these are people who work very hard and have no job security. And a lot of the time they're working just as hard as their colleagues on more established contracts. And I'm just left thinking that that is grossly unfair and actually puts people off the sector. I'm about to apply for a PhD here and I, it actually makes me dread what I could be walking into at the end of it, just from the, the very nature of, of, of the working conditions. Their working conditions are our learning conditions. And at the end of the day, I think that that's the most powerful thing to remember here. Yeah, I just wanted to come back up to talk a little bit about precarity. Um, as part of the, the UCU's four fights is around precarity, but just to stress that as an institution, we, we do have a working group with UCU. HR and UCU are working together to reduce the use of precarious contracts at the University of Leicester. And one of the pieces of work we've done, many of you will be familiar with what's happened at the Open University, where a number of staff have been shifted over to um, open-ended contracts. We're doing that same work at Leicester. 
So we have moved from using um, a, high num a higher number of precarious contracts to a much lower number. We're moving in the right direction. We haven't solved the issue. There are people on shorter term contracts, but what we've worked hard to do is make sure that people are on the most appropriate contracts. So using unit temps less and using longer contracts where appropriate and educating our hiring managers to understand different types of contract and when to use them. So we are working to reduce precarity, but we're not there yet. Any questions in the room? Uh, middle, the, you got yeah, I John, yeah, you guys. <laughs> Right. Uh, so, the, so Lisbon has admitted that uh, there are there is 30 million going into um, so-called capital investments, as well as there being uh, a significant surplus in the university's budget. And uh, as I believe was said by one of the UCU representatives, um, that that 30 million, along with the surplus, is more than enough to meet the UCU's demands. So. Why hasn't that money been used to simply pay the staff fair wages? So as I mentioned, the building cost is one cost that you pay, incur once, whereas pay is a cost you get about one for every year. So the other thing is that we don't have a big surplus if we had, and even if we had, it is part of the national bargaining. I can't do anything like, for example, six universities in this country have 100 million surplus. They can afford to pay more, but they can't because we are part of the national bargaining. So in terms of pay, we can't do whatever we like. So that's number one. And the second point is capital we have to invest. It's capital means not just new building. It's about running cost of this building. That's also come under the capital category. So any cost that incurs to keep this building going for learning, that is also capital cost. So if you don't spend the money, then we will have students complaining there is a leak in the building. It's not usable. So it's trying to find, make sure that we can run the university with the costs that we incur in capital. But in terms of pay, we can pay whatever we can. But if we want to pay more, we need to plan to pay that year on year. If not, we will not be having enough salary. Then we have to think about what do we do with a staff workforce that we can't afford. Would you like to reply? Yeah, so um, you, you've used the excuse that the 30 million is just one time and then it's done. Um, even if that is true, uh, and this isn't going to be a pattern, and this hasn't been a pattern, which uh, uh, I haven't heard verification of. It's still a choice that university has made to put that money towards uh, these big projects rather than simply paying uh, staff fair wages, which really I think should be the priority. Um, another online question. I've just managed to lose, isn't it? Thanks. If lecture materials are provided for the sessions that are impacted by strikes, this means that we can then be assessed on this material. How is this fair when we haven't received full teaching of this topic? Um, yeah, so if um, if there is if there is material on your course um, that you've not been taught because of uh, cancelled sessions or because the material has not been made available online, then you will not be assessed on that content. Um, and if you are in that situation, then that is something that you should um, take up with your head of school um, straight away because we've been very clear with our academic schools that we should not be assessing students on any missed content in the course. Question in the room? Jacket. Okay, you say about the um, capital expenditure as a one off. Freeman's uh, student accommodation costs 150 million, which is on the Leicester website. Students pay 9,250 a year, not including international students' higher fees, which comes to 185. Million nine hundred twenty-five thousand per year. Uh, the seven thousand international students obviously going to add on top of that. Staff at five percent, you said, would cost eight million per year. Now, the Freemans on their own is eighteen point seven five times the eight million. Sure, the fee, the staff pay may should go up in that time, but 
that one-off expenditure was 150 million on its own. And there were accommodation that was already remaining empty before that was built. And you said about obviously cutting costs here, there. Well, some of those costs you've cut include natural sciences, the course that's now being closed after next year. That will directly impact students because that's another course gone as well as any other small courses going. That will impact the staff who may well lose their jobs and some of those staff within the university are employed part time but doing full time hours and more. I mean, how are they going to be compensated as well? It's a multi layer impact here. Staff are being underpaid, students are losing out on courses, losing out on time. What do you have to say about this? And yeah. <coughs> So you captured some of the challenges that I face in running this job uh, because there are difficult problems to square because on the one hand there is cost going up and then my students and staff need good learning and uh, teaching and research conditions but then we have to create new environments as well so for example if Natalie said earlier we are trying to generate additional income and there is a course that is can take additional income but then there are staff saying I don't want more students but equally, there are other parts of the university we have more staff and less students. So I don't want to make my staff and saying, so you don't have a job anymore because you haven't got the students. So we need to find creative ways of balancing. That's the challenge. I'm not saying it's easy, but that is the challenge because the student demand varies. Some courses are very popular. We can attract lots of students. There are other students, other programs nationally, not just in Leicester. Nationally, there is a sh less students applying to those programs. So th what do we do? We, we cannot simply carry on a course for five students with 10 staff. It just doesn't make sense. So that is a challenge on, on the, in terms of staffing and which courses we offer. In terms of capital, it is not something that the, down on the whim of a vice chancellor or a head of school. There's a process, there's a lot of rigor in terms of us determining whether we are going to invest that level of money on a big project. So I hope you will give credit. People are not just thinking, oh, let's do a project for 150 million. It's not done lightly. There's a lot of thought that goes on to that process. Can we sustain it? Is that the right thing to do for the institution's long term future? I'll be gone in a few years time. You'll be gone. This university just celebrated 100 years last year. It needs to celebrate another 100 years. And my job is to ensure I don't do anything to damage that longer term future of this institution. And that's what we try to do. That's what the governing board does. We may not get everything right, but that's what we are all trying to do. And I can tell you the first question asked, that's what gets us up in the morning to come to work, to make sure we do the best for the students and the staff. Doesn't mean we get it right, doesn't mean we have the tools to do everything ourselves. I do understand there's a lot of balancing, obviously. But if we keep getting rid of small courses and lectures that would otherwise be there, the university is just going to become stale. And that's across the board, obviously, as well. I mean, pure science, biology, physics, chemistry, if you have 400 students, that's a lot of a lot of choice for employers to make. Natural sciences, for example, there's only, as you said, it's a small course and it is, but that separates the students from the other ones and that's going to be lost here and that's a lot of opportunity also lost for the university, as well as staff who have a different sort of level who you're also going to lose potentially because of this. And do you also not think it's fair to employ staff that are doing full time hours on part time contracts as full time? That's where I'm going. Just to correct you, not a single member of staff is losing a job as a result of natural science, and they're all staying in the university doing other things. It's just a shame to lose natural sciences, to be honest, because it's a rare course. Question in the room? Uh, back of the. Uh, yeah, so a question for, for the UCU actually. Um, so the, the university have kind of shown that they're more or less unwilling to, to change even at the expense of, of students now. So kind of what's the long term future of this dispute? Where's it going to go if, if the universities aren't willing to do anything, even when students are clearly being uh, significantly disrupted by this? I mean, I think uh, marking boycotts have been mentioned, although not, you know, obviously not confirmed, but like 
you know, if this drags on into into kind of years more, what what's going to happen, and you know, what is going to happen to students particularly in that time if if this isn't resolved? Yeah, I I think it's I think it's a very legitimate question to ask. Look, the the problem is something horrible has happened to higher education in this country. Uh, I remember when I was a student in the late 1990s, I didn't pay a penny to go to university. And I remember demonstrating, I occupied my university to protest against tuition fees when they were brought in. And we said at the time, if you do this, you're commercialising the sector, you're turning education into a commodity, and more and more you'll run universities like businesses. And what you see today is universities are run like real estate companies with a teaching factory attached. And it's horrible what's happened to students, it's horrible what's happened to staff. And that's why we're seeing industrial unrest in the universities in a way that we haven't seen before. Year after year, I, see, I, I feel like I'm on strike. And I don't want to be on strike. I want to be teaching and doing research. I haven't had a single year when I've worked in higher education that I haven't had to take strike action. We are hoping through this dispute that we can force the sector to change course. I'm pleased to say that there are some negotiations taking place today over our pay uh, demand. It looks like we may make some progress over pensions and we have to see what, what the employers come back, come back with. But for the reasons I've, I've explained, we can't afford to lose this battle. We can't afford it for ourselves. We can't afford it for the generations of students to follow. And that's why we feel so strongly about that. That's why we're out in the picket line at eight o'clock every morning. That's why we're still fighting. I hope that by taking the 18 days of action, we can end this quickly, resolve this dispute and lay down a marker that we want a different kind of education system in this country. Get a chance, so. <laughs> yep, so some of these questions have been at least partially uh, responded to, but one thing I wanted to come in <clears throat> come in on. So our current vice chancellor is the highest paid VC in the university's recent history. Um, I was wondering, can you explain your role and justify the extra value that you add? Uh, compared to the ordinary staff member, and I'm aware that you your pay is not cited by yourself or by a board, but nonetheless. Um, and so I want to add that current VC has not been involved in a continuous ordinary teaching role in quite a while, and those who truly understand how the university works and operates on a massive scale, but also on a minute scale, and I'd say they're equally important, are the staff and the students, and that level of democratic control I think is extremely important. So, in terms of pay, I don't think you're factually correct that I'm the highest paid VC in the university's history. Um, but leaving that aside, uh, I also don't want to repeat what I've said. Um, but I think it's also important, it's always easy to target the Vice Chancellor, and it's understandable, I'm used to that. But I think in the university, we have lots of staff who are paid differently for a purpose of doing a job. And I think we need to be fair. If I want to defend myself, we need to pay, be fair and looking at every staff member and whether they are paid appropriately for the job they do, and I believe they are. And that is a fair thing to do in any organisation, rather than pick one individual and saying your fair pay is unfair. Then we need to figure out why that is unfair. But my point is that, as I said before, that I'm, I can defend my salary because, as I said, I'm not the highest paid in the sector. You can look it up on the web or what the other vice chancellors are paid. And the, my salary is set by the remuneration committee. I have no involvement in that and they have set a benchmarking. They have looked at all the, sec the sector, what the appropriate salary for this role across the sector. They benchmark it, look at the size of the university, the function that I do, and they set the pay accordingly. And I believe that's the right thing to do. Sure, so um, I just wanted to come back on the idea of bringing in a strong democratic voice in the body of the students and the teachers. And I'm aware that that wasn't featured in your response. So I wanted to ask if you could come back on that 
and how how he would bring in a a strong and consistently listened to voice in the staff and students. So we have mechanisms in the university for doing that. For example, we work with the SE officers. In fact, we had this morning at the senior team meeting where they came and update us on the work they do and we have exchanges. So there are mechanisms within the university to involve students at the appropriate level. There is mechanism for staff to be involved. So for example, we have something known as a Senate where we discuss all academic matters. So we have, and in fact, this is a re requirement by uh, Office for Students. They require every university to have a proper governance. We have a proper governance. If we have a governance that is not fit for purpose, they will tell us we got it wrong and we need to fix it. What you're suggesting is a completely different type of governance, which is where everything is done by students, by democratic votes, uh, uh, academic staff or the vice chancellor elect, uh, chosen by students and staff. So uh, that is a completely different governance structure. That is not the governance structure we have at the moment, and that is not the governance structure office is asking for us either. I mean, I can say something about the governance structure because it's something we campaign over. Um, University of Leicester is exceptional in the sector in the lack of democratic representation of staff member on the lead, uh, staff members on the leading body. I mean, I would love a university that's run genuinely democratically, to be perfectly honest, by staff and students who work in it. I think that's a genuine teaching and learning community and it's the kind of world I would like to live in. But even with the limits of the higher education sector we have, um, until recently there was no democratic elected staff representation on the Senate. Um, we now have, what, three, four people on the Senate who are elected. On the council, there is no, the council is the leading sovereign body within the university structure. There is no democratically elected staff member on that body. This is exceptional in our sector. I can give you some, some figures. Uh, Cardiff University, fairly typical. 52% um, of the members of the Senate are elected by staff. Um, out of those, 4% 4, 4 of the uh, council, the leading body, come from the Senate and the Senate, because it's, it's represented, the, the majority are elected people, they get to pe put people on the council. Um, Birmingham University, the council, 17% uh, of its membership are chosen uh, among elected academic staff on the Senate. Uh, Newcastle University, Council has 25 members. One of these is directly elected by academic staff, so 4%. One of them directly elected by professional service staff. In other words, the University of, of Leicester is way, way, way behind the curve in terms of listening to the voices of staff and students. So it's all very well to say the Office of Students haven't demanded changes, but the way Leicester University is governed, choices have been made here. And the choice that has been made has been to silence staff. We are silent in the government structures. We have almost no say in how the university is run. And one of the things we will try to campaign for over the coming uh, months and years is for a revision of that approach and for a genuine democratic say by staff members in the university that we all work for and love and want to make the best place for teaching and research that we can. I believe that there is uh, one elected member of staff from the teaching system on council, which comes from Kazar. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so uh, so every university um, does governance differently in the country, and every university is governed by its governing documents. Um, so there is no one single right model. As the vice chancellor says, this university does um, govern itself in accordance with the Office of Students and the committee for university chairs and we are um, complying with all of those obligations and expectations. Um, we do have, as Joseph said, um, uh, elected staff members on the University Senate. There are also um, staff members elected from the Senate onto the University Council uh, and the Students Union also has a seat on the University Council and there are, um, I think, now five university representatives on the University Senate. Um, so I would argue that staff and students are well represented in the university's governance structure. I would also say the governance structure is not the only means by which we engage and listen to staff and students. So uh, in the, we recently ran a staff survey in the university and we've run a very 
um, robust uh, series of listening events with staff to understand their concerns and their worries. And we have a very active academic representatives network, uh, which the Students Union runs, and we engage with students day in, day out, week in, week out through that uh, engagement system as well. So uh, I hope that gives you a bit of a summary from the university's perspective. Just briefly to respond to that, yeah, that there's someone on the council who's elected by the Senate. 92% of the Senate is unelected, it's appointed. Um, that's not really democratic representation unless you sort of follow Vladimir Putin's model of democracy. Um, this isn't real democracy. And I, I can't get my head round why the university is so terrified of genuine democratic representation of staff members. If you genuinely want to listen to our voices, let's have elected positions on council for staff members. Why not? Most, most other universities have some sort of democratic channel. What is the University of Leicester so terrified of? Give us a dem democracy that we all want and deserve, and then we can participate in shaping this university in the way that you say you want us to do. Online. Um, why has it taken this Q&A to find out this information? Why have we not had a video or statement from Nishan previously? Sorry, is the question about <laughs> statement about? That's the entire question. Which one? This one. This one yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so clearly we are raising issues about this particular dispute and we have means for engaging with our union through our joint negotiating committee, which has happened regularly. So we engage with the union and our PVC for education has been sharing information about how we are supporting our students during that time. There is information on the financial statement. So we have not necessarily give, put a package together just about this in, uh, issue. So the purpose of the Q&A is to answer your question, but if you find some of this will be useful, very happy to put a statement, but I think, as I mentioned earlier, Paul Gavridge, our finance director, our chief financial officer, has already done this. It's on the web where the money goes in, how the university is managed and how the different pressures that we are facing. That information is available on the web, but it is not signposted with specific response to each individual question. Um. What key points slash actions has Nishan taken away from today? The first thing is, I think I would say clearly, we need to find more ways of engaging with the students and staff, because then we do that through the staff survey. But at the same time, I'm aware that it's not going to satisfy everybody. There are different audiences that have to be engaged differently. And I also think the other key message is I would like my union colleagues to wherever possible share the actual information about what's happening in the sector rather than giving the utopian view of what the world I would like to live in, which I think is a laudable aim. But the reality is I have to pay the cost on an annual basis, which means I have to understand the 4.2 billion reserve is no use to whatsoever. So I think I would ask uh, learning for me is to kind of work with my union colleagues uh, more effectively to see how we can both share similar information to our student body and the public at large. In terms of uh, the other key message is that we all need to work hard to ensure that our students are impacted least. So again, I will ask our union colleagues to work with the UK to see how we can address some of these and resolve this dispute as quickly as possible, because it is not good for our students, it's not good for our staff, it's not good in the long run for the country. So we need to see how we can resolve this dispute as soon as possible. Okay. Questions in the room? You've been waiting a long while, haven't you? Sorry. <laughs> Just looking more at, because obviously you've mentioned that there is support offered to students in who have missed lectures and stuff, but the problem is that, at least in my case, I didn't know that support existed until now. So, and I know you said that you think you've been quite transparent about it, but again, from the perspective, from my own perspective, it looks like that this support has, it looks like that's just not the case. So where, if you have been transparent about this support being available, where have you publicised it? 
where has it been? Where have you know you made people aware that it exists? Have you made people aware that it exists? Hi, thank, yeah, th thanks for the question. Um, so we have it's been out um, through uh, emails to all students from the ProVC Education. It's um, published transparently on the university's um, SharePoint pages and also on the university's website. Um, so uh, it, it has been very widely shared in terms of the steps we are taking. There's a very comprehensive set of student FAQs um, on the web pages. Um, I take I take I take the feedback though. If there are other ways um, we can engage students through different mechanisms, we'll certainly certainly take that away as a learning point, as as the vice chancellor said. Also, just to note that we can share all of the, our advice service at the Student Union gives independent and free confidential support on putting through your compensation claim. Um, so when that does come to it, you can come to our advice service for free. Any more questions in the room? How come an announcement didn't go out to all students about this Q&A session, preventing the chance for students to have a fair chance to ask questions? We announced it to all students, I would say, but I know not everyone reads their emails, so I don't know. That's fair. Um, two minute closing statements. Five minutes. What time have we got left? Five minute closing statements, if you wish. Should we? Uh... Cover doing yeah, yeah. yeah, hi everyone. I'm um, Cara. I'm Leicester UCU comms officer and I'm also one of the lowest paid members of staff at the university and one of the support members of staff who someone quite rightly mentioned, uh, well, you know, we're part of this as well, this dispute, not just the academics. Um, and I think all the points raised are very fair in terms of the pay and the finance and everything, but um, you know, it's not just about the pay, um, it's about the working conditions. Like Joseph mentioned before, um, staff do on average an extra two days a week. So that's seven days a week, right? Full time members of staff. And you will get emails from members of staff at midnight, at, so on Sundays, outside their working hours working for free because they care about students and they care about the student experience. That's why we work here, because we care about your learning experience. Um, and I just want to um, reiterate that this sector won't survive if none of us are here. 60% of people will leave in five years because the pay is not good enough and the conditions aren't good enough. So if that's going to happen, what will be left? Will it be a, a, a you know, one in one out system of fixed term contracts all the time? Because that's what we care about and that's why we're on strike, because this isn't sustainable. Being on strike every year, that's not sustainable. We don't want to do that. We don't want to be on them picket lines in the freezing rain. We want to be in the teaching, teaching you. We want to be supporting you. We want your education. That's why we're on strike um, and yeah if we don't if nothing changes soon um, then it, it won't be there in a few years time so that's why we're here and we we're, we really don't want to disrupt your education but that's what is happening and that's where we're at a breaking point because we've been forced into it. Thanks Cara, not, not much to add to that just to say Listening to the students talking in this in this event is it reminds me of one of the reasons why I became an academic because I want people like this around me who ask difficult questions, who speak truth to power, who challenge received uh, wisdom and all the rest of it. It's wonderful uh, to see. Um, I just want to finish on this. I, I thank you all for your support. I think accountability is really important. When I hear Nishan and other people on the executive board speak, there's always some other body that's making the decisions. It's the council, it's Senate, it's court, it's UCA, it's Universities UK, it's the Office for Students. Always someone else's problem. We're accountable. We're striking for staff and students. We're determined to win. And if you want to find us and ask us questions, you know where we'll be. We'll be on the picket line tomorrow from eight o'clock in the morning until midday. You can come along anytime, talk to us, ask us questions and we will give you an answer. We'll tell you straight and we'll tell you what we think. And that's what I believe in. I think it's absolutely right that you should demand the same from the executive board in this university. Thank you. So I think it is important for me to stress uh, it is the university. We are all in the university because we believe in the power of education. We believe in the power of giving opportunities 
but at the same time, I would think it is, I've asked this repeatedly from UNI UCU colleagues, the vice chancellors are not the problem. Individual universities are not the problem. We need to work together to change the government to understand the higher education system is not properly funded. Using vice chancellors as the problem is not the answer. Please, until the union understand and work with the universities, we will always have the problem. We will pick one against the other and the students will suffer. We need to get, be matured about it and say, what is the root cause of the problem? The reason I say the problem is out there. If we have a solution, we will do it. Give me the solution tomorrow. I will do it for you. I haven't got the solution. If I can pay 12 million a year every year for the next 10 years, I will do it tomorrow. I can't. If I agree to do that now, in a few years time, I will come and tell you, sorry, we haven't got the money. Some staff have to go. That is not a good planning. That is not how you run a university. So I wouldn't do anything likely. I don't get out of bed thinking, what bad can I do today? I get out of bed thinking, what good can I do today? How can I make this university a better university? That's why I get up. That's why I do this job and I love this job. And I want to make sure, but that doesn't mean it's easy. That doesn't mean I can solve all the problems. If I can, I will. When I can't, I have to influence the right people. The reason we all, when you, we have to be realistic. When you work in an organization, there is a structure. That's for a good reason. You have a line manager. There is an executive board. Why is it there? Because when you run a large organization, you cannot run out any other way. It'll be anarchy. So it is important to understand there is a purpose for why these structures are there. And it, we need to work within the structures. We can all think about a world, brand new world that looks completely different. Just to give one example that Joseph mentioned in terms of higher education, uh, that we all care, the marketization. Yes, we can have a different model. There are so many other students, there are only two solutions. If the government decides to fund the higher education entirely, then who is going to fund the NHS? Who is going to fund the teachers? If you all want to fund that, do we need to, where does the income come for the government from? It's taxation or other means. Where does this, I don't, this is my basic economics. Somebody knows the economics better than I do, need to explain to me. If there's another solution, let's do it. There isn't. The reality is we have to find within the resources we have and manage, do the, make the right decisions. That's what I try to do. And I try and do the best I can. If there are better ways I can do this job, my exec board is very happy to engage. We engage with students and staff. Please don't wait for the Q&A. Talk to the SE officers, talk to your members of staff, talk to your union colleagues if that's the most uh, easiest way for us to, for you to reach us. But let's work together and see how we can solve the fundamental issue of funding the right education so we can do the best research and the best education. Thank you all very much for coming tonight. Thank you to you. Thank you, thank you, board. Um, in terms of compensation for students and information about that, if you Google University of Leicester compensation strikes, it is the first link that comes up. You can only put a full complaint through in April once the the, the strikes have well ended, um, because that, that way the university considers the full claim. Keep a record of lectures and classes that you miss, and if you need any support, please do contact the SSU. We are completely free, independent of the university. Um, I'm happy to provide any support. If you have any other questions, I'm sure both UCU and the Elective Board will be happy to receive them over email. Um, but thank you very much, and I hope you all have a very good evening. <laughs>